there's always like 10 minutes and I take out like 20 seconds. Okay. okay. <laughs> what's the best what's the best cheese for the cheese tax? What do dogs really want? They said a parmesan was fine. Yeah, yeah they yeah, like a good they, hard cheese. They like uh most cheeses, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. The worst uh you know, cheese that you can get from Kroger, whatever shredded, that's what they really like. Yeah, they like oh, stuff yeah. that you can like the stuff that I use every day. Yeah. That's the stuff I really like too, because that's how you get your dogs to eat <laughs> the, actual food. <laughs> The, yeah, me- yeah, yeah. Put it the, in the Mexican <laughs> shredded mix that, yes. I, that I use for everything. Yep. Yeah, that, that is the universal <laughs> house cheese. It doesn't matter if you work in cheese or not. The Mexican shredded mix from Kroger is the cheese you use for everything. Yeah. It's like the, it's like the high life of cheese. Yeah, it is. 100%. <laughs> oh, I Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Kentucky Commons Radio Hour. I am Michael Moeller, joined tonight by John Renane, Hello. David Satterley. You. We are at Bluegrass Home Resupply here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, our guest tonight is Adam Steckler, uh, the uh, roaming cheesemonger uh, and owner of Steckler Specialties. Adam, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thank you for having me. We're going to be talking about a lot of cheese tonight, uh, but... Uh, we're opening the show the same way that we always open up the, the show with a uh, special beer. Uh, we like to rotate between uh, the three of us, between John, David, and I, of you know something to bring, uh, whether it be special or not. And uh, tonight, I it's my, it was my turn, so I decided to bring um, this beer that Tristan Chan from PortDrinking.com gave to me a while ago, actually, uh, when he was still at Ratio uh, uh, Brewworks Beerworks at a in Denver, Colorado, it was a 2019 bourbon barrel aged Russian Imperial Stout from Ratio. Holy smokes! Uh, this is uh, one of the first beers I think that Ratio ever made. Uh, it's an 11 and a half percent Imperial Stout. Um, a lot of specialty grains, a lot of a molasses. Um, it was uh, brewed, I guess, on their 20 barrel system when they got that involved when they launched in 2015 uh and the very first batch that they made immediately went into bourbon barrels uh and aged for about a year and uh this is uh, this is the case of uh, a beer that i probably should have drank sooner uh perfect time to drink it today but yeah it's been four years so why not open it and share it hell yeah uh david you want to describe that label for me though this is a wizard um (laughs) His third eye is open. He has a nice little pointy hat, but not like the white pointy hats that we don't like. Um, he's centered in front of a intergalactic um, body. Uh, maybe the moon. I don't know. It does say genius wizard and like some king gizzard in the lizard wizard text. Um, <laughs> I do like it. Um, big, big gray beard. Actually, I kind of want this beard when I get older. It's pretty it's sprawling. Yeah, easy. that's some like evil Gandalf stuff. Uh, his name was Sauron. Sar- uh, Saruman. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. This is from Denver. Love visiting there. Uh, got to go to Ratio last year, so let's let's give this a go. Heck yeah. And Adam, have you uh, frequent in Denver? I uh, went four years ago for the subsequently the Great American Beer Fest. Oh, nice. We happened to be in at the same time. Uh, did not go to the Great American Beer Fest, but we did go to the Great Mexican Beer Fest that had Mexican wrestling in the street. Um, Excuse me? It that was quite awesome. the experience, <laughs> yes. They had a lot of, and it, now that I'm put on the spot, I wish I could remember some of the breweries that were there. But there were uh, quite a few uh, Mexican craft breweries that were doing a pop-up that same weekend. Uh, it's really more my speed than the great american beer fest i don't know of many minic like mexican craft breweries i would love to explore that it, more it was good yeah. i mean there was a lot of very very uh light crisp beers um a lot of stuff that reminded me of, i don't know if you're familiar with the colomecas stuff but very very crisp lagers and nice. super delicious yeah heck yeah we were there coincidentally for great american beer fest as well i lost my beloved nalgene on the train from the ah. airport ah those things you can never get back and so, so many lost stickers so many yeah, stickers. yeah yeah exactly and we did we didn't go to the mexican beer festival which honestly you would have maybe done that one of the days but we did go to um beer stat and they had uh like amateur wrestling 
so nice. going on in Ooh, there. Yeah. I'm so a big wrestling. Fan. Not as good as uh, OVW here in Louisville, yeah. High Valley Wrestling, but yeah. that was uh, pretty good from what we saw of it up there in the upper lounge area. Um, I uh, I really enjoy going to Ratio there in the Rhino neighborhood of Denver. Whenever I go, um, it's it's always kind of fun. They they have this one beer called King of Carrots. It's a carrot saison, I mm-hmm. believe. I remember. Uh, that's always a fun one. It's named after a Neutral Milk Hotel song, King of Carrot Flowers. Yeah, yeah. A Neutral what now? Neutral Milk Hotel. No, oh, okay. It's like my favorite band. Are you familiar with that? Is somebody I've who, seen Garden somebody's State. Somebody's got to be okay. a hipster at this yeah. table. Isn't I'm something? familiar. I, I'm I'm a closeted hipster. I I know I know most things, and I just go, yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's just smiling, not smiling, not. Yeah, yeah. Well, the beer's great. Uh, it's very rich, very robust. I don't think it's too old. I think it tastes fun. I think it tastes amazing. It tastes like it smells like a bourbon barrel right yeah. off the bat. Very rich, very well rounded, kind of like um. Dark cacao, kind of deep, crispy, crunchy coffee kind of thing coming through. I like it. Yeah. Roasty and dry, but there's a lot of barrel punch on it. A lot of barrel. Yeah, it tastes like a burn uh, ball. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Porsche Drinking. Yeah. Thank you, Porch Drinking. Thank you, Tristan. Sorry it took me so long to drink it. Um, and uh, if you are interested in seeing what this beer looks like, you can, of course, uh, check out our YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash at louisville ale trail uh it's a really weird way that youtube does that right i mean it's, it's, I feel yeah, like it's, I don't a, know. it's a weird url yeah it's, um, i think they intentionally make it hard to tag on non-youtube associated platforms yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's hard to link to but regardless yeah go check us out subscribe rate listen share do all those things uh if you want to figure out a way to, to help us that's not in a monetization way uh that's the best way to do it but if you do feel like tipping us a few bucks you can always do that at patreon.com slash ky commons I'm going to throw out an extra request for just this week and maybe in a couple weeks. But if you're listening to this and you're a brewery owner or your brewery in your backyard has a Kentucky Common, get in them DMs. Yeah. We'd love to try that for you. Yeah, just let us know. We'll we'll organize the logistics. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, I can't talk anymore either. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, yeah, we do have uh, Adam Steckler here uh, this evening. Uh, Adam, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the world that you live in. Well, I have been a uh, cheesemonger for about the last 10 years. I'm currently an ACS certified cheese professional. For means, those for those who aren't in the game, should we define cheesemonger for the people? Uh, cheesemonger is basically just one who buys and sells cheese, uh, works in cheese. I think it's a very loose term and it can mean whatever you want, but you have to work in cheese. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what <laughs> my business is, is cheese. Uh, and currently, I have my own business. Um, I find that I don't really necessarily enjoy doing it all the time. Um, I've been working in retail for <laughs> nah, it's, that sounds terrible. I love so, what I do. Yeah, dude, I, I hate love my job what I too, do. Bro. <laughs> I love what I do. But hey, that's uh, honest. I've worked in retail for about the last ten years, and uh, just at that stage of burnout where you say, like, okay, well, what's next? What are we doing next? Like, what's the new thing? So. Working a bunch of different jobs and trying to figure out what we're doing next, doing pairings around town, which is super fun. Uh, Just trying not to overdo it at the moment. Uh, But it also makes me kind of step back a little bit and really appreciate what I do and why I do it. Um, Spend a little bit more time going out to the farms that I source products from and talking to cheesemakers and just kind of seeing what their struggles are like and how, you know, as a, a person that's in this business, how I can help uh, move things along and help their business evolve. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people don't realize that cheese producers have a really hard time actually getting their products to the appropriate, to the appropriate, uh, consumers just because they are farm based workers. A lot of them work 20 hours a day. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's a very, very strenuous job. And it's like, that's the last thing on their mind is how do we get to the city to sell this product? to city folk who are going to be the people with the money that have the ability to buy these products. I think I interrupted you talking about a cheese certification. Can you tell us about oh. what that is? What do you, uh, is it, so uh, the ACS is the American Cheese Society. Amazing. Uh, yes, it, it's, a, it's a great time. Um, and every year, once a year, they open up their testing. Um, they basically give you a long test. Uh, cost of 
few hundred dollars uh, and it's wherever their conference is for the year. So last year I went out to Portland, Oregon, uh, took the test for the second time uh, because the first time I thought I was ready and that was not true. Um, <laughs> and, but yes. Uh, Eating a lot of cheese since then. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, and just, you know, reading up on things, you know, uh, I think uh, a, a really big facet of cheese is that uh, much like brewing, there's a lot of chemistry involved. There's a lot of moving parts involved. And the whole process is much bigger than you probably think of the store. You just go, oh, we just go to the store and we buy this cheddar and it's great. Um, but there's so much more to it and there's so much story to it. Um, and that's really what I spent the last few years trying to learn about. Yeah. Like if you want to do a brewery uh, brewing certification, that's not specific to brewing, like uh, say like a Cicerone, say you're a server, you want to become Cicerone certified. You do have to delve into that aspect of, yeah, like this, how it's made. And this is also what it pairs with. And this is also how you judge it. And like, it sounds like for your certification, you did have to cover a lot of that ground as well. It's a, it's a lot of uh, where things come from, uh, why they come from these regions. Uh, what is, special about the making you know um you you learn about what type of fields uh different animals graze in at different times of the year to make certain cheeses uh you learn about the chemical structures of a lot of cheeses you learn about bacterias and molds and uh it's really a super super interesting career to be in um and i think back to what we were talking about earlier with feeling burnout is when you start to get to the point where you're like well, I don't feel that way about it. I just feel like I'm working nonstop to like mm. make cheese boards or to to make a grilled cheese sandwich or do whatever I'm doing. And I stop thinking about like why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. Um, it You just have to step back a little bit and say, OK, like I need to appreciate this again. I really yeah. have to be able to take this in. And this is kind of what's fun about doing these and doing pairing events now is that I get to sit down with people. We get to try things. We get to talk about things we get to talk about cool products and where they come from and why they exist and it makes you kind of realize that like what i do is really fun and it's super awesome but maybe i don't need to do it in the manner that i was doing it in for so long so why, why cheese and what made you get into it uh that's i've always liked food um and i really got a like a a love for cheese especially when i was uh like my first job ever i worked for tony boomba's pizza nice 16 years old. And then I jumped from pizza place to pizza place, always in the same company. And uh, it was just one of those things. It was the first place I'd ever had like Gorgonzola. It was the first place I'd ever had Fontina. And uh, there was just all these new flavors. I was like, this is, this is wild. This is really cool. And uh, growing up, my father grew up on a dairy farm, dairy farm oh, adjacent. Cool. Um, and you kind of grow to appreciate the, the, plight of the dairy farmer, if you will. And I think what was a really big influence to all of this was looking at Kenny's farmhouse down in Austin, Kentucky. Um, he was a dairy farmer looking for ways to, you know, improve his business, make more money, uh, traveled around Europe, learned a lot about, learned a lot about cheese and cheese making and how you can take a product that doesn't really sell for much and turn it on its head and make something new and worthwhile. Um, and I just think it's a super interesting business. Um, it kind of makes me feel, I meet a lot of farmers that make me feel that sense of nostalgia when you're a kid and you have family that works on a farm or they have farm property and it's a whole different style of life. Um, I don't know. It's just something that I feel like I can do inside the city that feels comfortable and it feels warm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In like a nice brie or like it's a nice, a nice uh, brie. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, we are very grateful that you're here today. All right. Well, we're going to eat a lot of cheese too. So, yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you that cheese has always fascinated me, especially since COVID. Uh, I decided like everybody else to take up all these new hobbies mm -hmm. uh, during COVID. And oh, one yeah. of those was, uh, going, cheese. going into, going into Kroger, <laughs> checking out the, the, the little cheese section there and like yeah. the, 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 the manager's special wooden basket. Mm -hmm. Just like what cheese have I not had before in my life? And I'd grab something new every time, and just sit down at my house and have a concentrated effort of just like, let me actually try to taste this. Like I taste through beer or spirits. Mm -hmm. And that's 
really fun to do. And it's also really hard to do if you're not used to it. Yeah. Well, it, uh, I still find that to be super fun and interesting. Um, going into a cheese shop that I haven't ever been into before and just picking up something that's unfamiliar to me and saying like, oh, I've heard about this. It's just fun. Yeah. And, and Kroger's like up their game over the years. I remember like that that didn't exist maybe five, six years ago, but uh, about a year ago, <laughs> Michael and I <laughs> were up in Madison, Wisconsin for Great Taste of the Midwest. And uh, we have a buddy that's from there. Hello, Nathan Molesky. Um, <laughs> that sent us to a shop called For Imagination. Mm. Um, renowned cheese shop in Madison, I guess. And they only source Wisconsin products. Um, and it, I mean, it was like, Two kids in a candy store, but also we had no idea what candy no, yeah. was. <laughs> More like two <laughs> middle-aged people in a cheese Absolutely. store, if you're being honest. So, but. so like we walk in and it's, I, and I assume they're used to this, but it's too, we're just standing there like, what, what I, the fuck do we do? <laughs> like, and finally, I don't even know protocol. Like, yeah, and I mean, without even like raising a hand, this, uh, you know, very friendly worker comes over and is like, you guys need help <laughs> like yeah, yeah we do <laughs> she took and us i can show you cheese yeah she took us through a small tasting and we ended up spending probably entirely too much money there but that was what i was gonna say you're talking about like you know finding new ways to kind of turn something that's made out of cows into like these really refined products cheese is one of the things i would honestly say even more so than beer that i'm almost completely price indifferent to like yeah. i'll spend twenty dollars on like a thing of cheese and i'll be like you know, nickel and diming bananas or whatever. But Absolutely. Is that an increasing trend or do you find that true among consumers? Uh, yes, and, yes and no, but I, I like, we were talking about it earlier. Like we all have our daily drivers and it's like, you know, like, <laughs> what's, the, what's the high life of cheese? Yeah, the Mexican <laughs> shredded cheese. Yeah. That's that's like the high life of cheese. Um, and it, That's the always, purple bag. Yeah, it, <laughs> uh, yeah, it always <laughs> hangs around your house and it's it's fine. And it's not, it's a lot of cellulose and it's not necessarily cheese, but like that's a, <laughs> but like that's the the daily driver. And then, you know, there is things that are much nicer. Like, you know, I, I use New York sharp cheddar if I'm making pimento cheese because I want something that really pops and I want a ton of flavor. If you're really trying to find flavor, then maybe the the store brand like shredded cheese is what you're looking for. Um, but yeah, it's a, I spend way too much money on beer and uh i spend way too much money on cheese well there are worse things to spend money on. Well, well what do you mean that like the shredded mexican shredded cheese at kroger is like the cellulose of cheese oh i mean it was, or so is cellulose rather so a lot of a lot of the cheeses that you'll find in a in a grocery store uh they use cellulose or <gasps> like <laughs> uh basically i yeah, so it's like a wood powder or like a fiber powder that is put on the outside of cheese, and that's what keeps it from sticking together. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, yeah, there was a big uh, uproar about this probably four or five years ago about shaker parmesan. I was going to add, that was one of my questions in the yeah. back of my head. Is that cheese? No. So what there's is that, There's man? a lot of cellulose in that. Okay. Um, and that was kind of And that's of what, just like plant fiber kind of, right? Yeah, it's it's like a wood fiber. Yeah. But um. That's what keeps everything from sticking together and turning into a it's ball. Like corn starch ish or whatever. It just kind of yep. does that job. Kind of kind of keeps everything separated. Okay. Uh, I will say in that same visit uh, to um, the, the, the cheese shop that David and I have visited in Madison, I also picked up a little book that I've become a little obsessed with uh, called Cheese, Sex, and Death. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. A, a Bible for the Cheese Obsessed oh, by yeah. Erica Kubik. Uh, and apparently she's like really well known in that world. Yeah, yeah, she's she's awesome. Uh, I actually got to meet her at the last conference we went to. Um, there are cheese conferences. Oh, oh yeah, that's, I think that's, like yeah, <laughs> the cheese conference is cool. This year it's in uh, Des Moines. <laughs> Well, that's a horse. <laughs> yeah. that's a horse. That's a <laughs> Bro, what the fuck else do you need? You got infinite cheese. But I guess I guess the the upside of that too is it's like a a driving distance thing. But I am from oh, the I Midwest, so no, that's fine. Portland, Oregon's also driving distance. You know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you drove to Portland? No, no, I oh, never okay. flew. Um, Bold. Yeah, but she's she's awesome. She does fantastic work. She makes beautiful displays, um, and she's great at selling products. She. She's awesome. I I just keep paralleling like beer to cheese at this point in the conversation where there's an intense commoditization of beer and cheese that it's probably, you know, like 
there's adjuncts that are in, you know, yeah. store bought beer, but you know, you, it passes off. It, the Mexican blend, you know, tastes fine, does does the job, you know, everything else. But the the actual craft cheese has, eh, you know, it seems like it has this niche and people that really love it. It's a it's a lot harder to to get into, and it's a lot harder to like. I think beer kind of sells itself because you have so many reasons that people go after beer. It's like. I like to drink beer because I just need it. It's my medicine. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. Papa's medicine. Um, and but with cheese, it's really like <laughs> it's it, cheese. There's, there's something about it that's like gives you this sense of of being a little bit bougie. Like it's nice to have like like a cheese and wine night, and like it's not something that I want to do all the time. But it's just something that you're like, yeah, mm-hmm. we're gonna really splurge on ourselves. We're gonna take care of ourselves tonight. It, cheese is like a great snack too. Honestly, it just. Something to have like in the middle of the day. It's just oh, like, I agree. I, I mean, I had a little piece of pepper jack for lunch. Today, like, so. come on, I'll fuck with some cheese <laughs> anytime. Um, that kind of back to your story. So you kind of you said you kind of got started up just working in restaurants and discovering yeah. new flavors and stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, t- talk us through just a little bit more briefly of just kind of how you got to the point where I mean, I don't think I know anyone who knows more about cheese than you. You, I, you might be like the Louisville cheese expert. Uh, I mean, there's definitely people that know way more. At least in in my radar. But um, no, it's just, you know, if you want to do something and you want to (laughs) like, there's not a lot of competition for it. Um, But, (laughs) but it's, uh, it, it's really just became a thing where I was good at it. I really like selling stuff too. And it's like when you work inside of something where you get to push products, it's much like bartenders. There's bartenders that go to work and they sling drinks. And then there's bartenders that like take a lot of pride in like what they're serving and where it's coming from. And, and like, you know, I think it's kind of the same idea. Like I worked at Whole Foods for five years, I guess it was. Um, a, lot of good, a lot of good people in Louisville oh, came out man. of that, your generation of the Whole Foods folks. Yeah, I... I uh, Buddy was there then, and Stephanie, uh, Courtney was there. Like So Buddy's, yeah. Buddy's probably still one of my favorite people to cross paths with. Yeah. We, we would do a lot of uh, beer and cheese pairings with Monic. And, yeah. And it's it's awesome. And you'll find, we'll, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but you'll find that uh, Monic does kind of circle back around into cheese a couple times too. Um, and we're going to try some. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, yeah, Whole Foods really kind of cemented the love for it right before uh, it was bought out by Amazon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which, you know, things change. Things change. Everything evolves. But uh, I got really into specialty goods in general. I, I was a cheese buyer. I was a coffee buyer. Um, worked closely with beer. I was never the buyer of that. But, you know, that was kind of the department we worked in. That was a, was Chris Johnson was around that time too, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, Luke Bruner. Oh, Luke is there. Yeah, 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 Luke was there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, a lot of good people. But were, were yeah. you there when Top Chef came in? Uh, no. So uh, okay. I, a lot of that too. Um, I think that was Louisville and Lexington. That was yeah. right around the time that the new Lexington store had opened. Yeah, and I helped them open that place up, and that was it was interesting. But um, yeah, I, I got to miss all those days. So I was doing. <laughs> I was normally gone by about one in the afternoon. So I would come in you know, four o'clock in the morning and unload boxes and nice. get out before the, the day really started. Courtney has a good story about meeting, meeting a Nicholas Cage at Whole Foods when she worked there. Mm. He came in while he was working on a movie. So he's very normal. Very normal. Yeah, guy. He, he seems it. like a very normal guy. <laughs> yeah, when, you think of, when you think about Nicholas Cage, you think, wow, that guy's a really average, normal guy. <laughs> That's a very uh, average, uh, normal guy. So I, I feel like you hear, like everybody says that they like cheese. And even some people, especially in internet culture, they're just like, I love cheese. It, it, but I also feel like the the knowledge of cheese does not ma- match the enthusiasm of yeah. cheese. So like, what is that next step that somebody is like, really interested in learning more about? What do they what what do they do? What resources would you recommend? Uh don't ever think that you're gonna make any money and just do it. I mean it's a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a passion job. It's a passion it is, job, it right? Is a, so. It's a hundred percent a passion job. Um I you know, I think I'm almost 40 now, but it's like I think that finally at this point I've kind of accepted that like it's not something that I'm gonna necessarily ever make a lot of money on, and that's okay. Uh, but it's just something I like. Um 
and if you like something, you should you should approach it and you should, you let should it do go. it. You should let it go, and then you should come back to it. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like this podcast. Yes. <laughs> so so yeah, I think that's that's the big thing. You know, if you really want to learn more about it, uh, invest your time and put effort into it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, resources that you can use online. There's a lot of cheese making classes. Unfortunately, there's not a lot in Louisville, um, but Indianapolis, there's a ton of cheese making classes with a company called Tulip Tree creamery um go to pairings learn things just be curious that's a, that's a lot of it there's so much information that i still get on the day-to-day -day by just using the internet you, even before covid i've and this is true today i still have a little tab in my browser bookmark section uh for a website called the international cheese academy I know. and that's a certification that i've been like eyeing for four years now and i just haven't done it because just, just take it it's not it's not that difficult of a test from a consumer standpoint, like if there's listeners here in Louisville who are just kind of, uh, yeah, I think what you were saying was resonating with me because it's almost like a meme. It's like, I love cheese. Like guys are like, I love bacon and girls are like, put me in a room with some cheese and I don't need no man or like whatever. <laughs> is, is that a meme? <laughs> I've never I seen that. That's a meme. <laughs> I think maybe that's a meme. After <laughs> maybe today. that was a dream <laughs> I had actually. Uh, but it, from a, like a consumer standpoint, do you have any places around town you'd recommend as like a good good cheese spots kind of akin to what you guys were talking to that you found I mean, up in Wisconsin? Let, let me set the stage. Yeah. Okay. It's like Thursday. You've been working your tail off. All right. Talk slower. You're ready to just like just go out and just relax a little bit and you walk in, you sit down, you're like, give me the Fontina. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's, no, you're out. Okay. Beer, cheese mongrel. I extra, need a, extra a sharp cheddar. I mean, I, I guess. I mean, I don't really know that there's a right or wrong answer to that. Uh, it's really about what you're looking for. Again, Kroger is awesome. Um, but really the reason Kroger is awesome now is because of their acquisition of Murray's mm -hmm. cheese. Um, that's done a ton for them. I forgot about uh, it. Whole Foods is still awesome. Just it drives me crazy to no end. It's like, you know, I remember there used to be this real culture at, at Whole Foods. It's like, what can we get for you? Mm -hmm. What can we let you try? And that's really how you get people engaged with what you're doing. Um, and I feel like there's not really much of that anymore. I can't tell you how often I go in there and I'm I'm like just dead eyed on things. And I can always find something for myself. Um, but I also know what I'm looking for or not looking for. Do you, do you do the Ron Swanson thing in Home Depot? <laughs> I know more than you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually, I don't. I, I I like to be super humble about it because I like to know what people's honest opinions are. And I, I think when you start to tell people that you know about a product, they start to get scared about it. And they're like, oh, I've got to impress this person. And it's not it's not necessarily true. It's like if I if I ask you like, hey, what beer are you drinking right now? What do you like to drink? I don't really want you to pull out some crazy beer for me like if you're like i'm drinking coors it's the banquet beer great that's awesome uh i think i think that that people get a little bit afraid if you start to tell them that you know about stuff or they start to try to like one up you and it's like no just tell me like what are you eating right now what what makes you excited um i'll tell you there's a few spots in louisville that do a really exceptional job at it there is a murray's shop in the new albany kroger um, and there's a girl named Roselle that runs that shop and she's an all-star. That's she's, cool. She's I will go just, there and check that out. She is awesome. She, if you catch her, she's, she obviously works busy time. So Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, um, but she's awesome. She's a rock star at it. This is what she does and she enjoys it. She's been a cheese professional for almost 10 years, if I remember correctly. Yeah, she's got a lot, yeah, of, dude, a lot she's, of room she's on a, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's, but she's awesome. Uh, and I mean, like, I think that's the, the real thing about, uh, any sort of specialty food is like finding the culture that makes you happy and and just kind of getting into it. Um, but yeah, any any local cheese shop, if you go in, they better offer you samples. If they're not offering you samples, then they're they're not doing their job. Uh, but you should always ask to try things. You should always ask. Uh, it that's part of being in a cheese shop. You should always have samples in front of you. Well, this isn't a cheese shop, but I know you brought some stuff, I, I so I'm going to ask you to try <laughs> so it. Right. All right. All right. So, so you want to try the first one? Please. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's right. right. homebrew shop. Uh, as far as our, uh, for our first uh, show and tell segment. All right. This is going to be a, uh, a threefer. There's three different parts to this. <laughs> okay. I will say the best, the best podcast episodes that we have are ones that involve food. All right. You're good. Let me scoot your behind you. 
Yeah, we did one episode that involved some cabot cheese. It was super good, and uh, I think yeah. we all like cheesed ourselves into a coma. Mm -hmm. There's still a little left. Well, this is uh, we're gonna talk about beer and cheese today. Please. So that is the main focus that I'm gonna bring in today. Uh, I'm gonna grab a couple things out of this refrigerator. Yeah. Yep. All right. So. <laughs> Uh, the cheese I brought, the first cheese I brought for you today is called Mount St. Francis. Uh, and this is a funky mistress. I was going to say, I, I smell, can smell some. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask who was like, uh, yeah, cheesing over here. I see why they call it cutting the cheese now. So the outside of this cheese is orange in color uh, because of the introduction of bacteria called Brevibacteria linens. So these bacteria basically um so it's a process right so you separate your curds in a way you put it in a mold and then you let your uh cheese dry out this cheese is aged uh in a vacuum seal for about eight months wow they pull this out and they start washing the outside with salt water after a few days uh this mold is or this bacteria is actually introduced to the cheese and it starts to grow on the outside few days later, when you start to get a little bit of orange, they start introducing his dark materials. Whoa, really? So wow. this cheese is basically washed with his dark materials. Uh, the bacteria eats the cheese. That's what gives it this big, funky smell. Um, that same smell is actually caused by uh, the same bacteria that is in your foot, which is why your feet stink. Um, <laughs> John, this is why your feet stink. Um, <laughs> thank you, God, thank you. So uh, traditionally with a wash dry cheese, I would have something like a Saison. I like something that also has a little bit of sweetness in it. So we did a honey added Saison. Um, and you tell, tell tell people more about this because you're going to do the same thing I'm going to do, which is read a label. So Yeah, Noblesse Oblique, um, Jester King, which is in Austin, Austin Texas. Texas? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I've never had this, but I mean, Jester King is bar none, one of the best sour breweries around and especially their Saisons are always on freaking point. And then this is with, uh, Alberon Brasserie, which is uh, Belgian or French. It should be Belgian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess this was a collab that they made together. Beer de Garde. So that's like a Belgian style Saison basically. And then they've added honey in here. And Saison just means summer, so it's a nice light, you know, usually a little bit of wheat, usually a little bit of Pilsner malt fermented with that really nice Saison-y yeast that brings out those kind of straw, uh, clove, sometimes kind of light coriander notes. Um, and it's just light, crisp, crushable, effable in whichever way you want to like. Okay, so we're going to do this two ways. First, we're going to try his dark materials. All right. All right. Just a little bit. So it shouldn't shotgun the can. <laughs> <laughs> it's you a can. perfect shotgun beer. Here, get another glass. Thank and you, we're sir. Gonna see, you're going to be able to taste a lot of the same. Uh, basically, the malts will still reside mm -hmm. on the outside of this cheese. That's what's cool about the whole coming. To, people always compare, That's you know, beer and wine or uh, cheese and wine. They think of that as a natural pairing. Um, and it is, those things go great together, but, uh, cheese, especially cheese like this has so much more in common with beers like this that kind of have that so crazy fermentation side behind them all. You gave away some of the, the process here. Is this particular cheese more about the process or the ingredients with the bacteria being specifically called um, out? A little bit of both. I think you totally. one without the so other. Capriole is a small, uh, goat cheese producer that's based out of Greenville, Indiana. So very okay. uh, hyper local to us. Um, and actually Judy Shad, who is the matriarch of this company is kind of the, the grandmother the of she is the goat. <laughs> She's the goat. She is the true goat. <laughs> She's goaded. Um, but she is the, the matriarch of this company. And she's one of the uh, like original goat cheese makers in oh, the yeah. U S uh, along mm -hmm. with the, company now i can't think of the name but um cypress grove out of california okay. uh they were kind of the first cheesemaker she's still independent she's still rocking it out uh 
she's awesome. Um, but yeah, this is washed in his dark materials. So I would recommend we're going to take a little bite of this mm-hmm. and try it uh, basically side by side with this beer. This beer will also go really well with it. Kind of one of those things. What grows together goes together. Hell yeah. I like that. That's a good saying. Yeah, it's a. So what do you what do you, is there a cheese cheers uh, uh probes probes N- that's not really no. what they say. <laughs> <Is there? laughs> salud salud <laughs> all right so here we go it smells kind of like uh woody and a little bit salty a little bit i mean it's cheesy <laughs> for lack of a better term very creamy it's soft it's creamy. So creamy the little bit can, the rind has that not a crunch if you but, breathe in real hard before you take any beer you're Gonna get a lot of that funk. Yeah, it does smell like my old gym shoes a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but man, the flavor profile is insane. That's popping. I really, I love the creaminess of the inside too, and a little bit of the texture from the rind. So when you say it's washed with his dark materials, like what's that process look like? It's it, so a lot of people think it's just like, well, they duck in his dark materials and that's <laughs> it. But really, what the process is is you would basically dip your gloves into his dark materials, rub the outside just to keep the surface moist as the cheese ages. Mm. So that's really the the process of, of And I'm sure uh, the, the beer kind of soaks in a little bit, but it'll, it then the bacteria are also going to be working on the 100%. beer. And they kind of just combine the two. Kind of people yep. talking beer, especially like the New England IPAs, about biotransformation of different like hop compounds and stuff. But I guarantee you there's some, like, interaction and metabolism between those bacteria and the beer and the cheese and the, like... I like to think of, like, brevilinum bacteria uh-huh. uh, a lot like you would think of Brettomyces. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So it's just a sugar... Yep. Like, whore. It, yeah. Yes, yes. It's, it, it's going to eat everything. Yep. And that's what causes kind of that funk. Mm-hmm. Um, it but, is very good. It's, yeah, it, it's really super good. good. It's yeah. just... Uh, I don't love the creaminess. So this is kind of like a... A washed rind che- cheese with training wheels. Like w- I wanted you to have an experience of something that's delicious and not going to be a complete palate killer. Mm-hmm. It should. It's also worth saying that his dark materials is freaking great. It's, it's, this is such a good, very good. great milk salt from Monic yeah. just down the road in Schnitzelberg. I wonder if the lactose. I, I just wonder if they would taste the same if you had a milk stout versus non milk stout on a cheese like this. I just wonder if there's any, any special interaction between the bacteria and the lactose. So this cheese at one point was, was washed with Willitized. Oh. oh, yeah. When I was, I made cheese with this company for a little bit just because I was curious and you curiosity like kills the cat. <laughs> um, wow. But yeah, when when I was working there, this was actually made with Willitized uh, and they kind of switched over to. Uh, his dark materials fully. <laughs> it's a little bit cheaper too, I bet. Yeah. 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 Well, you, you and more local. How often can you call them and be like, hey, Lagunitas? <laughs> yeah. I need yeah. six barrels of Willitas for the rest of the year. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, dream on. Well, and Lagunitas is no longer like a privately owned, you know, a small business, quote unquote, anymore either. They're bought by, uh, I can't remember who oh, owns I mean, them now, but it was never really. Is, is as an unexperienced person, is there anything that I should have discerned to point me towards that being washed? with his dark materials or is that just process that's just me knowing okay okay all right that's really just me knowing so a lot of times trying to glean something yeah you you won't really a lot of times you won't necessarily see special washes um this i just know for experience that that's what they use for this one um so you'll see some stuff from jasper hill jasper hill's a cheese company based out of vermont uh, they are an affineur, meaning that they age cheeses. That's their their real business. So if you ever see Cabot Cloth Bound Cheddar, Cabot is a company you're familiar with yep. from yep. one of your last shows. Yep. Uh, Cabot Cloth Bound is actually, uh, they coat it in lard, wrap it in cloth, and they throw it in their caves at Jasper Hill. Wow. So that is a collab type of product. Can you buy cheese futures? Like you can buy like <laughs> yeah, oil sure futures. I, I don't know. I think maybe that's the business I need to be in. Yeah, buy a I, cow. Like now I'm thinking about it and I'm like, man, if I had the if I had the capital, I could invest in some cheese. There's like some caves in Missouri, I think it is, where they have like the world reserve of cheese. Whew. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Goodness. There we go. I'm not quite sure on that. I will say that there are a lot of awesome cave age cheeses uh, that are made in the States. Um, right outside of Michigan, I believe there's the caves of Faribault, um, which are fantastic. It sounds like a place that cheese is aged in. Yeah, they make, they make a blue cheese there, uh, <laughs> called the Felix 
and it is a showstopper, out of control. Good and I'm stuff. imagining the cave environment is good for cheese just like it is for beer. It's just very temperature steady. It's like you can moisture controlled. It's I, just like safe and snuggly. I find it super interesting with the way that cheese is treated as a like the FDA or or uh, the health departments treat cheese because they treat it like it's this product that's going to get you sick and it's it's going to it's so it's so bad for you. And you're like cheese doesn't really uh, uh, go along with the same uh, food safe things that you learn in restaurants where mm -hmm. it's like keep it below 40 degrees mm -hmm. it's like you're aging it in a cave where it's gonna be sitting at you know 44 45 degrees um it's not always that cold uh the the english and the french also just to have no rules about it um and it's kind of better that way i uh, you know there, there's i've had a lot of french cheeses that are pretty spectacular but they don't really go by the same rules that we abide by in in the u.s that big cheese lobby man the, so the big cheese, cheese lobby. lobby so i actually want to go wherever that is that sounds fun too. i had to look there's 1.4 billion pounds of cheese stored in a cave in missouri 1.4 billion this was started in the Holy 70s shit. by jimmy carter and he was trying to give farmers a break but the government couldn't buy milk and store it so they instead bought cheese and stored it Oh, um, okay. Let's talk yeah. about that for a second. And then it still exists now, but <laughs> we're, not, cool. we're not going back into the 70s. No, no, no. That's just one thing that's interesting about cheese, too. And cheese has such yeah. a long history with Thank humanity. You. I mean, it's crazy. People have been doing this for, do you know, I mean, the oldest, I don't, the oldest cheese that I could think of was, I mean, obviously the Sumerians had it, but cheese seems like one of those things that goes back to probably right around the time or maybe even a little bit before we started domesticating animals. Oh, yeah. Somewhere in that kind of like Natufian, like there's Gobekli Tepe like and you know, era. There, there, there's like every couple of years they're like, we found the cheese. New cheese. That, we yeah, found yeah. cheese that the Greeks made. Yeah. And it's in this vat. And it's like, who would dare eat the forbidden cheese? <laughs> this, this right here. Uh, but that's such a, it's a great way to store calories long term. And, you know, beer is good uh, because it doesn't spoil, like water can spoil. Um, wine is good. And you can also take those calories that are produced during, you know, small windows of the year and preserve them to be able to eat in the winter, to be able to eat in the whatever. Cheese is one of those like caloric stores from humanity that probably humans wouldn't have survived in the way that we did if we didn't have those if we didn't discover those things and it's a culmination of like the cattle or the you know the animal that's making it uh, the domestication process but then also the bacteria and the ability to store it like it's very fascinating think about the history of cheese cheese and sex beer. and death yeah yeah is that what that's all about yeah yeah that's awesome so all this right. is a completely different experience tasting this with this noblesse oblique from jester king it's that's fantastic it's brighter yeah it, it pairs better yes it yeah. opens up um, yeah this is this was the pairing that i wanted oh, to do yeah. but this is i just wanted to bring yeah, the, the his dark source. material just to kind of see what they're working with now did you just dip your cheese in your saison did i see someone do that nope maybe, no. I, maybe I was just thinking about doing it you're projecting <laughs> you. mm. okay <laughs> is that po is that uh party foul i'm not mad at it though uh yeah you're right this this cheese is now all of a sudden a lot brighter mm -hmm. after the saison and that's kind of the idea of a pairing is that you really want to bring out all the flavors that like this dark material kind of hides some of those flavors. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. And you said this is made in what was the farm in Southern Nia? It's Capriol Farms, Capriol uh, Farms? Greenville, wow. Indiana. That's so cool that it's so close to home. Yeah, it's, it's really close. It's just right off the Greenville exit. Mm, that's fantastic. Thank you, sir. You're Delicious welcome. cheese. It continues to get better. Yeah, this is, this yeah. is fantastic. I just want... And and so when you... I mean, is this, you buy this at like farmer's markets. You go there and get it like just directly from them. Yeah, because you said one of the harder parts is mm -hmm. them getting it out to the market. And it being labor intensive and mm -hmm. 20 hours take a day. Time. Take your time. <laughs> so Capriol's been around. They have a team. They, they do a great job. You can buy this at Whole Foods. Okay. It's a plug for Whole Foods. Go buy it at Whole Foods. Um, and you're supporting the you're supporting the farm ultimately when you do that. You know, if you can't get to the farm, you yeah. might as well get it where you can get it. There's probably a few other uh, local shops around here and between here and Lexington that would sell it. 
you can get a lot of their stuff at Cultured uh, downtown. I do like them. Yeah. Can you do like cheese tours like you can do brewery tours? Oh, man, that was really fun. At a past uh, spot that I was working, we had the brew tours guide that would come through. Keith. Keith. Keith Mitchell. Yeah. Or not Mitchell. Uh, last name? Keith. Keith. Just Keith. 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 Yeah. <laughs> it's just Keith. <laughs> just Keith. Yeah. Um, he would come through with with groups and they would stop by and I'd make them like sample plates and things like that. And it, again, it's not really a cheese tour. There's not much cheese in, in Louisville to speak of, but it's kind of a fun concept all, all the same. Yeah. So let's buy a bus. Yeah. Let's buy a bus. Let's go to cheese tours. I mean, that's that's like long term. Uh, I think at some point I would like to get back into selling cheese retail. I think that having a big specialty store in Louisville is awesome. I think there's a lot of cool opportunity for it. Um, unfortunately, I, I think that lots of pasta was kind of like the beacon for a long time. And maybe in the past decade or so, they've kind of fallen off that that like pedestal that maybe they once held. Maybe that still exists. Um, but I just don't find the same quality that I used to find there. I feel like a lot of people shop for cheeses at the same place they go for a nice bottle of wine. Like I know, like you know, the liquor barns or like does Total Wine do cheese? Like, did those kind of are those uh, places good they, or not? A lot of Boar's Head. Okay, yeah. it's a lot of Boar's Head sponsor- sponsorships, which is kind of like okay, it's better probably than yeah. So big cheese, but I guess I guess that was the thing that I was really trying to focus on with the business. And you kind of when you start to talk to it and you start to think about like how what's the logistics of me like cutting cheese and distributing to all these places and setting up shops in there it's like it's a full-time job to do one shop much less to try to be like oh, i'm gonna undercut myself and set up like five or six different places i'd still like to do it but i would have to really think about the logistics of doing it and like how does it how does it actually work is there a way to go direct to consumer yeah i don't know that that's ne- i mean Having a shop's really the best. Yeah, best somewhere bet that because you, you can't do that online. That we were talking about again. We've talked about it too. It's like it's hard to say like, "Hey, <laughs> you want to try this cheese through the internet?" Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> I do. But that's not going to help you buy it at at the time. That's like, how I feel about the homebrew store. It's like you can buy you can buy homebrew kits on Amazon, but it's just exactly like what you're saying. Like you can't ask questions about, "Hey, I want to tweak this," or "I want to do bells too hearted," but I want to do this, but I like love mm-hmm. that. Da, da, da. And like, what malts do you think are the best, and what has the most smoke profile, and what has you know anything else? Yeah, which is what has kept humanity together with those stored calories and the conversations. I, I like. think that I think that retail stores are a vital part of our existence, and uh, the more that we get towards the internet and away from those, uh, the worse off we probably are, in some ways. Chat GDP taking over. And because John said Chat GPT taking <laughs> over, that means it is time for our ceremonial Berg break. Berg break. Uh, we just had some cheese. We just had some some beer. Uh, personally, I love a good Underberg uh, in between, uh, you know, samplings. Um, if uh, you're not. Oh, and John John's playing the Underberg song right now. So that's fun. Um, <clears throat> uh, Adam, you're, you're familiar with Underberg? Oh, I'm familiar. Yeah, good, uh, good digestive for those not familiar. Uh, I'm no stranger to the Berg. It's uh, it's good, you know. Like if you just want to break from from alcohol, if you want to just settle the stomach for a second, uh, this is always a great. Well, that uh, <laughs> this is always a, a great uh, go to uh, little beverage, real fast. You I, know, I think it has to be said though to take a break from alcohol. This is 44 percent alcohol. I mean, but it's it's like <laughs> inconsequential amount based on. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, you can buy it on Amazon. You can yeah, buy it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's it's <laughs> the, the FDA doesn't it, it considers it a food product. Um, so it's forty four percent volume. So by volume, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, it's a small volume. Jury's out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know, uh, Louisville's Louisville loves Underberg. Uh, I think that's what we've learned over the last uh, few years or so. Uh, you can find it in multiple breweries around town. Um, Multiple bottle shops. Multiple bottle shops. If you um, don't have it, ask for it. If you don't have it, ask for it. Ask for an Underberg. Uh, ask for a Berg. And so it's a good little break, more than anything. Yeah. Like, you drink a couple beers, you just, like, want something different, or it's, like, the end of the night. It's a good, good little palate cleanser for yeah. the next thing. So, cheers, y'all. Cheers, Underberg. Cheers to Bergs. 
It makes, does. makes me hungry for uh, more cheese. You know, uh, oh, Underberg's mug. No, <laughs> no, Underberg's barrel age. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, all right. It's, a, it's aged in Slovakian oak, I believe. Someday, uh, we will get somebody from Underberg on to explain the process to us. Uh, no, but it's, it's just it's like a, well, I mean, not, I'm not saying they have to give away the secret sauce, but that's another whole fascinating conversation. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we like to do every so often uh, are uh, is to take questions from Reddit. And granted, we usually do it in the context of beer, but I did decide to get questions from Reddit. Uh, and so this is open forum, but although Adam, I think that you might be the most apt to answer. Some yeah, of this. usually we just kind of try to shit on the beer nerds uh, of the world, but yeah. like cheese nerds are a thing too. So we'll we'll actually just start this out for you, Adam. Um, this comes from uh, user Dairo Zhang uh, on our cheese, uh, titled "Storage Methods for Cheese." Hi, everybody. I've been slowly spreading my interest to cheese more and more over the past few years, and I'm searching for a better storage method for my cheese. I normally receive the cheese in the, I think, wax paper, paper from the cheese store. And after I initially open it uh, in the store in the airtight, I then store it in an airtight Tupperware container. This works well enough for most cheeses. So far, hasn't been working too well for cheeses with Bloomy Rind. But I'm just looking for something a little bit better as a step up that can ideally hold cheese for two weeks to at most a month. Hmm. I'm open to all ideas. Thanks. That's a nice question. It's a good question. How do you store cheese? Avtine paper. This oh. is this is my this is my brand plug uh right here. It's Avtine O V T E N E. Uh it is a eggshell technology paper um that uh, uses a little bit of plastic, so you're not wrapping in plastic, but you're also not wrapping in paper. Uh, it's a nice film. Uh, I've wrapped breeze in it that have lasted for a month. If you wrap in plastic at a retail shop, you're going to have about a week to sell a Bloomy Ride cheese like a Brie. Months. Uh, and I wouldn't recommend putting everything in there for months, but the the life of your cheese is going to be much, much longer if you use Optine paper. That is my favorite one. It's the easiest one to work with. And it's like folding origami around your cheese. And the whole point is that you want your cheese to be able to breathe. Is that you want you want to be able to breathe a little bit? Yeah. You don't want to suffocate it. Cheese cheese is a living organism and it will die. And once you. once you use this paper, you can't reuse it. It's cheap enough that you don't have to. Kind of like okay. Parchment paper. Um, yeah, thing, I mean, but... it feels like parchment paper. Is this what that is back there? Yeah. Oh wow. So okay. it feels gotcha. it feels a lot like a mixture of parchment paper and wax paper. Cool. Um, but it just I don't know their secret. I don't know the secret sauce, but it's really good. That's an excellent, excellent, excellent shout out. That's a, yeah, because like you said, or we were talking about earlier, like you go in and you spend an obscene amount of cheese or money on cheese, and you're like, okay, now how do I have it for like a week or two? Because yep. you're trying to buy it on futures. So you can buy it on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. You can buy it uh, at a lot of cheese shops, and it's normally about fifteen to twenty dollars for a pack of twenty sheets. Hmm. However, those sheets are about three times larger than you need. You just cut them down and and. They last a while. So you got enough for sixty cheeses. You and if you're buying some nice cheeses, cheeses you're yeah. saving money. Yeah, you know? it's it's. I mean, I I can't speak highly enough about it. Um, as a person who's worked in a lot of retail shops and spent a lot of time uh, merchandising cheese, this has been the thing that I've found just really keeps the waste down. Should you ever vacuum seal your cheese? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's uh, funny. The but health department says no. But yeah, I mean, it's not bad either. I, I so there are certain like HAPSA plans you're supposed to uh, like if you if you're working commercially and you're vacuum sealing cheeses, you have to have a HAPSA plan, et cetera, et cetera, because they HAPSA say is health and safety protocol. What is that? HAP, uh, what uh, does that one stand for? It's some it's some uh, long acronym like that. Government bullshit. Okay. Government. Yeah. That was yeah, that was what I was going to say. And I I'm just glad you beat me to it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's really um, they say that, you know, it traps bacteria. But it's just it, like guidelines that are like recommended. They say know. that. Yeah. But they say the vacuum sealing traps bacteria okay. and things like that. And and then if it's out of temperature, it's going to grow. All, it. I don't I don't really buy that. But. Um, yeah, I just wrap it in this paper. Uh, it'll it'll do everything Oftine. and more you want to. 
of, of team. team. Of yeah. team. The next question is actually a, uh, a two-parter, uh, with the first being uh, a question of mine, because uh, it just gives me context for the next question. Uh, what is a uh, raclette? R- raclette? Raclette is a super meltable cheese that is normally served over top of roasted potatoes. And oh, that's the Instagram cornichons. cheese. Yeah, it, it is also a wash dry cheese. So it is a funky exterior cheese. Uh, it, it, it originates uh, somewhere between France and Switzerland. Um, there's French raclette, which is going to be uh, really funky. And then there's Swiss raclette, which does not necessarily have as much rind on it. Um, Emmy Roth, uh, I believe, is the company that makes the the Swiss version of raclette. Um, just super melty. He, he or put it underneath a heat lamp and then kind of scrape off the cheese onto whatever you're serving. Okay, thank you. That that gives me context for the question that comes from <laughs> username worst name. Uh, I'm having a raclette party this Saturday for my birthday. And I'm looking for beer pairing suggestions. Random internet search results suggest everything from box to sour reds or browns to Belgian strong pills. But I'm looking for specific beers I can pick up in Wisconsin. Let's for intents and purposes just get rid of the Wisconsin part. Uh, that'll oh, no, blow my that. that'll blow my socks off when paired with the deliciousness of a French raclette. I, uh, I mean, I think we got to start here. Honestly, uh, if you can find this uh, noblesse oblique. Uh, I think that you'd be thrilled uh, it's going to rock you. Um, But uh, I think that your search inquiry was correct in that there's not really a right or wrong answer to this question. Uh, I think it's really based around what you like. I think that Saison's would be great with having a recollect night uh, just because you're going to have a lot of earthiness. Um, And it depends on, I guess, if you're doing a French recollect, you're going to have a lot more funk. Uh, I I don't think that there's anything wrong with getting a spotted cow mm-hmm. and having a raclette night. I think that sounds pretty fantastic. Raclette honestly, and spotted cow that sounds amazing. I think so too. Um, what what are some of your all's favorite beers in uh, Wisconsin? Mm-hmm. Wisconsin, yeah, yeah. I mean, like anything, Glaris comes to mind uh, easily enough. Um, something I think would go well with that is um, like any of the Blackberry Farms. Their oh, saisons yeah, are yeah, really good. Yeah. yeah. Or um, like an Oxbow. Um, they were putting out some really cool farmhouse pale ales for a while yeah. that had a little bit of like the bitterness and also the, like the funky character with them too. Um, and I mean, if you want to be like pinkies out, I mean, just go yeah. straight to Belgium and get a Dre Fontenin bottle or. <laughs> Probably not. I, getting Orville. I think Orville would be fantastic with a raclette night. That's what I was just thinking about. The, like the Belgian pale ale. I mean, an Orville just sounds so good with that. Absolutely. Um, Bush Light might be in there somewhere. Oh, I'm I sure, think I'm you sure it is. I mean, the first time I ever, the first time light. I ever went to Wisconsin, I was, uh, I got there pretty late. I, I was staying with a friend, and they opened up their apartment door at like 10 p.m. And it was this couple that just moved there, and they they greeted me with a uh, a high life and a plate of cheese grits. <laughs> Hell yeah, like literally dude. when they opened up the door they just handed it to me i was like oh this is great welcome to wisconsin yes <laughs> they love you uh, that's incredible <laughs> yeah so I, I guess i guess to answer the question fully like it is going to be completely up to you but those are some of like i think that finding a nice saison buy a big bottle of something they don't put it in a big bottle because it sucks normally um kind of how i feel about about that most of the time if you're if you're gonna have a party and you want to do it up right buy something that they felt was worthy of putting in a big bottle and limiting that's a good it's move probably yeah. awesome and share it share yeah and it. share it yeah. and yeah. share it and yeah. you can buy three or four and you can share all of them yeah these are meant for experience not for like and and that kind of sounds <laughs> but so having a raclette night at home i feel the same way it's really about the experience it's not about like like oh, I'm gonna get full on raclette because it's it's it's, 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 it's <laughs> I'm here yeah, yeah just like, pour it I'm right here in to eat a bunch of cheese and be full. It's it's really about an experience and it's about uh it's about sharing the time with your friends. Um, so yeah, get some shareable bottles and and uh, figure out what you like because if you like it, 
it's probably going to go with whatever you got. That's excellent advice. If you didn't want to do like a birio cart, could you do a ricletio cart? <laughs> like you have to eat like six <laughs> ounces of cheese every lap before you like finish the race. Oh, oh my God. Do, you, do we not know what birio cart is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, so. you've just created a new like uh, problem <laughs> in my life. So. Yeah, it's, it's like a, it's actually a bike race. Actually, you, <laughs> it's five k. It's, it's like an every, it's an alley cat bike race, <laughs> and then at every stop, you have to eat uh, at least three ounces of cheese. See, yeah. I'm I'm here for this. Fun. Yeah. Uh, this next one comes from a uh, user. Uh, Chi Lu. I don't know. Who cares? Uh, cheese guys, <laughs> what's your weirdest customer? I work in a local mm. cheese shop, and I had some pretty weird customers. One time, some Polish guys came in. I am Dutch. Uh, and they came here and liked our cheese. Uh, they bought uh, seven kilograms, around 15 pounds for the Americans here, Holy hell, of young cheese. Of cheese. So my question is, what is the weirdest qu customer you've had? Uh, we had a lot of... I've had a lot of customers that, that buy large volumes, and I never really find anything too weird about that. Uh, my weirdest customer is actually, oh man, I can't even talk about it because sometimes I, the weirdest know, customers are the best customers. I know too, too much about this person. <laughs> there was, there was this person that was a, like a very, uh, noticeable figure that came into Whole Foods a lot. And, uh, when we were asking, we had a cheese, it was Jack club. Harlow, uh, yeah, <laughs> something like the Jack Harlow. Um, he's just a very unique person he kind of carried around everything with him at all times uh rode a bike everywhere a uh, very strange guy and he would always come and he would sample all the cheeses we had out and that was really his routine um was he was the sample guy and then he would talk to you about cheese and it's he never bought anything i don't really think he had the money to buy cheese and that's fine that's not the issue but when i asked for his email address i'll never forget it <laughs> Um, <laughs> because it was just so off the cuff and, and he was so excited about it. Um, I, I don't want to say it. I'm on, trying to think uh, how you can tell us that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have to Maybe say it Just later. give us the thing without the at dot com or would that ruin it? Uh, yeah, it would ruin it. <laughs> okay, it right, 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 right. Yeah, it was, it, it was pretty absurd. Did um, it have to do with a cheese kink? Or? No, no, it was really, it was, it's really, it's really just shame that. You know? Yeah. It, it's just about, like about tell, tell it and John promised to bleep it out. It's oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There all right. Go. So it's 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 <laughs> at angelfire.com. Oh, okay. and, and it was uh, <laughs> you'll you hear it later and you'll understand. But um, yeah, it, it I don't know that he was like for some reason, I just remember him like I'm like, oh, I'll never forget you. Um, but I've also had lots of, <laughs> I'll never forget you. you made an oh, that man in the, the bicycle. I think he just wrote the sequel to The Notebook. Like, yeah, this I is did. the new, like, uh, still a better love story than Twilight. The cheesecloth. I, I, I know he's still alive, and I see him riding a bike around every once in a while, which makes it, like, a thing where I'm like, I can't, if somehow this got back to him, I'd feel so bad, and I'd probably get sued. And, like, I'm not trying to do either one of those things right yeah. now. Um but uh, I think other than that, like I, also at, respect for having an angel fire email. So yeah. Like, oh, I mean, how random big yeah. ups. Um, but uh, other than that, we at the last shop I worked at, there's a lot of uh, French customers that would come in um, and just just talk trash with me. And that was always fun. It's always nice to see people from different cultures that are like, this is awesome. This is a place that I want to be. And this is a this is something that I want. Mm. Uh, this last one, uh, it's more uh, quick fire. Uh, John and David, David, I want you to go first, and then you can give your opinion because I didn't even know this was the thing. Because we're going to be terrible, and then uh, you'll tell the yeah, truth. Yeah, this comes from, uh, I don't even care who it came from. Uh, it's on our cheese. And uh, it says, uh, the restaurant I work at is restructuring the tip pool, and they've decided oh. the cheesemonger who builds the board gets a tip out. We're not sure what the percentage would be. Does anyone have any experience with that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent tip out? For, he built the board. Or they built the board. Okay. I, mean, I would kind of consider that like uh, being the beer buyer or being like the cheese buyer. Should you get the tips? It's back of house. If you're, if you're doing all the work, I mean. It's a, it's a tip pool, though. So like what percentage... I guess I'm not sure. You, so we'll uh, obviously I'll just be speaking out of ignorance and we'll let you give the educated opinion. Yeah. But I would suspect 
a small percentage, but a percentage that would be enough to incentivize, you know, caring and then trying to work with the servers to help them do a better job interfacing with their customers. Um, so basically trying to, to create an incentive to empower the, to, to motivate the beer, the cheese monger, is that the right term? Sure. To interface with the staff and just make sure they're prepared to go out and do their job. 15%? And to be clear, I meant 100% to the cheesemonger because all, oh, <laughs> yeah, all they're doing is picking up the tray and walking it out. No, they're no, talking, no, no, they're no, talking no, no, to no, the no. customers. Okay. They're doing that thing you were talking because you can't be there all the time no. to have that face-to-face -face interaction with everybody. So it's like, how do you empower those people to do their jobs the best? Uh, is it giving them all of it and being like, I don't want none of this. Like, you know, you guys just do your work and get your tips. Or if you do have an incentive, and this isn't even talking about you, this is like how one would do it if one was trying to organize the best business model. I'm I'm sticking with like 15%. Um I think it matters how much razzle dazzle they have. Are they putting out garbage? Because I I'll, I'll be honest, I make really nice looking cheese boards. Um if you don't want to tip me out and you just think that I'm there to make food for for customers and I'm part of the kitchen staff, okay. Don't tip me out. But I don't know how much extra razzle dazzle I'm going to put in it. Uh, their cheese boards are very time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, they also can drive business in ways that you wouldn't expect. Uh, you know, Instagram, we, Instagram. Um, there's there's a lot to building them and doing them well. Uh, so it really just depends on. I think it's like any other job. What's it worth to you, right? What is this person doing uh, uh, above average? Uh, job worth to you and what's it worth to you if he does a subpar job or they do a subpar job um i think that's the real question is is trying to figure out what's it really worth to you because um i'll be honest i've worked for tips in, in a cheese okay. shop and uh i made really good money because i did really good work uh so yeah. yeah. So maybe you just leave it up to the individual server's decision so that yeah. it's more about the relationship. I don't think I I think that uh blanket tipping is kind of uh, bullshit to begin with. Tipping yep. in general is kind of fucked it's honestly. Kind of, it, it, but, it is, but it's also I know, like I know. It, people don't pay anybody enough money to yeah. really That's what I mean. Do their backing, you know, yeah. That's what I mean. Also I think that people tend to like minimize things as like an artist could say like oh i could paint a warhol it's just a soup can and it's like yeah well if you fuck could you. If, if you could you'd, you'd fucking do it you'd be, yeah you'd be so, warhol. Well, yeah you yeah. know it, I, it, a lot of it's more about the person that does it than the actual thing right because like andy warhol could shit on the floor and you would go like oh this is this is art. Yeah. And it's like, but if I did it, you'd just be like, dude, that's gross. <laughs> I wish you leave. didn't do Sir, that. Sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I, gu I guess it's all about context and about, you know, what's it worth to you? Well, speaking of uh, things that are worth a lot of money to me, uh, there's a piece of cheese sitting on the table oh. that I've been buying for a while. <laughs> Round uh, two. Yeah. So let's go ahead and uh, see what else you got for us. Okay. This is another type of beer cheese. Hell yeah. So this is going to be, uh, this is the hops. It is made uh, in Indianapolis. This one's not going to be nearly as funky. Uh, this is a double cream cheese, meaning that it has at least 60% butterfat. If you see triple cream, that is a 70% butterfat cheese. Oh my God. Wow. This is 60%. And so that's fat. more whey than curd? Or am I totally mixing up the, the oh, terminology Oh, you're totally there? mixing them up. Okay. The, the butter fat butter fat is explain that part to me. So um, when you are making cheese, you have your milk that goes into a vat uh, and you separate your curds in your way. And the curds are the, the things that that congeal. Yeah. So Those it's like the protein. Can, yes. And the so uh, this is just going to have a lot of butter fat left. OK, um, so uh, I don't know what kind of cows this company uses per se, but you know, a lot of American cheeses use Jersey cows. Jersey cows have a much higher fat content in their cheese. Um, this is super high fat content cheese. Um, okay. And this is blended with a, uh, it is a Porter and I can't remember the name of the brewery now offhand. Did we say center point or center point center point. Yeah. Okay. It is the uh, center point oh, Porter. Uh, this is also kind of funky. Um, and this one has a little more tang to it. So, yeah, 
Has a little more body. Mm -hmm. Still nice and creamy. More going towards like the, uh, like, not cheddar, but more cheddar-y than the last one we tried, which mm -hmm. I would say was more like um, moonstery for, I don't know. So it was just kind of more, I don't know how you would describe that. I need to work on my cheese vocabulary, but let's get in the This the, one's the a little rind. bit more like a Havarti to me. Okay, yeah, there you go. Cause, and it even has like the, uh, what do you call that? Not marbling. Off, it, well, it's like off-gassing. So basically yeah. those are uh, reminiscent of a Swiss yeah. or like a whatever kind of cheese. And then, really good. Now you have the one last beer mm -hmm. to pull out for this one. This is incredible. Yeah, really good. Yeah, I have no words for this. This is very good. This Hops is, is one of my all-time favorite cheeses. This is one of the best cheeses I've had in so recency. Wonderful. Yep. And uh, this is a pairing that I've done with this a few different times. Uh, do some pairings with Mile Wide Brewing. Um, Scott Schreffler is a great friend of mine. Excellent, um, dude. All, all the people at Mile Wide are excellent, dude. It's excellent. So this is one that we we have a little project that we do with. Uh, so fucking good. It used to be with uh, another bank, but now it's a uh, gentleman with PNC Bank. Fifth which third. I, fifth third. Jeremy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're right. He's he with used fifth to be third with now. PNC, He's, yeah. yeah. This Jeremy. is like a blend of like every cheese that i like mm -hmm. like at the swiss manchego it's, like it's, it's a showstopper dude yeah this has got everything in it from like a, a little tiny bit of nuttiness to mm -hmm. the tangy and it's still super creamy so it's got that characteristic that i would define as like sharp but what it, is that i mean tangy is probably a better term for that because it is like a little bit it's what i love about a really good like sharp like cheddar or something like that but yeah, Gr Gruyere or like something is probably better, cl closer to what that is. Um, and then, so this is uh, McPoyle Milk Stout. So Hell yeah. we wanted, I wanted to do something that has, this can stand up to a little bit more body. I think that you found with the His Dark Materials that it just kind of washed out mm -hmm. that cheese. Sure. This is going to go well with McPoyle because you've got this big fatty cheese and you've got this, like this fat will kind of coat the inside of your mouth. And then it'll just kind of wash this beer right down. Yeah. When it keeps getting, uh, the, the more you taste yes. the beer, it gets deeper yeah. and deeper and deeper into that. <clears throat> this is one of my favorites that I've I've done um, over the past couple of years. And so I I thought that this would be a very fun one to share with you all. Yeah, dude, this is, this might be in my like, I was going to say like my top 10 favorite cheeses, but I'm just going to go ahead and put this one right up at the top. Honestly, I don't know if I've ever had cheese I enjoy more than this. So how do you actually... Um, best actually experience and taste a cheese and beer pairing because like I see that you have a strategy like you're you're like taking a sip you're taking a bite I like to try the cheese alone first um, and just kind of get the flavor in my mouth and kind of experience like what I'm working with uh, and that's really like I've done a lot of cheese pairings where I've had to do them blind where it's just like these are the beers we're doing. Pick out some cheeses and you go, oh, shit. So a lot of the times with those, what you do is you kind of go to your your textbook pairings. You know, you do a wheat beer with uh, a Chev or you do an IPA and uh, a cheddar. Those are going to mm -hmm. the big, like punchy IPA and a sharp cheddar. They balance each other out really well. Um, and then certain things like this you get to play around with and like I I normally will take time and sit down with Scott and we'll bring out five or six different cheeses and five or six different beers and we'll try all of them back to back and we'll say like this really goes with this why this really goes with this well why um but yeah I think that dark beers um go really well with blue cheeses they go really well with a little bit of, of fat so anything funky creamy sounds like a terrible job it's, for the record it's, yeah. it's <laughs> awful <laughs> The, the, the uh, tang that you get out of that, which is kind of what I would, might call sharp or might call tangy or whatever, but it almost reminds me of like, obviously McPoyle or any of these stouts aren't uh, like sharp, but there is a certain little bit of like tannin that comes from those like dark roasted grains and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That kind of has given me the vibe where they do different things. Yeah, it's totally different. But those two things connect somehow on my palate, which is really cool. Yeah, it just it, it makes a balance, right? It's it's two conflicting flavors that that just kind of lay on top of each other and work mm -hmm. yeah. it's like peanut butter and jelly don't taste the same but they go this really good incredible. together yeah 
Yeah. This is wizardry yeah. at its finest because the idea of trying to even source these things and pair them together sounds daunting yeah. on a whole. But it is very good. Very You're right. Good. Just it's just like the 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 fat and the mouthfeel of this is works so well together. Also, so. I just like ate that whole rind. <laughs> I, know. Oh, I mean, are you not yeah. supposed to? <laughs> no, you're welcome to. I, 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 I did my too. favorite part. <laughs> yeah, I did too. <laughs> it's funky. I mean, it's I I don't personally care for it, but I've also had this cheese about 900 times. And, yeah. Um so this, can yeah. you can you is there an instance where you just shouldn't eat the rind? Like I don't there's I still don't really know those rules. I mean, like I think if you see a cheese that there's a couple things like Pecorino Toscano. I wouldn't really ever eat the rind on Pecorino Toscano. Uh, there's lots of like, don't eat the wax rind. It's kind of like eating a crayon. <laughs> <Wax>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I like eating crayons. Yeah. So like red wax Gouda, you probably don't want to eat the rind on that. I mean, you can. Uh, so those like a laughing cow. You're not supposed to just. Like to, just <laughs> yeah, it's it's not like a, a Percocet. You don't just <laughs> pop it in and <laughs> take it down. It's way better than a Percocet. Um. About it is addicting, though. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, yeah. Is there any truth to the the casein being uh, an inhibitor that is the same as like other drugs? I I mean, you, there's all sorts of studies that say that you know it it releases something in your body like a, a a certain chemical that makes you feel high. And I mean, I feel pretty high right now, so I don't I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's true. High on cheese. But I mean, like, how could you how could you like eat this and then be like, I'm mad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do any I want to be left alone. Like, I mean, it's just Of course, you know, just with like just just with the same with like alcohol, everything in moderation, but there's no way eating something that like high in calories and high in fat. Like humans are designed to love that. That gives you yeah. that little dopamine rush, that little serotonin I mean, rush. I do want to be left alone, but with like a <laughs> brick of this. Like, like a plate of this. A like don't more. touch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Jeez, um, night. So uh we're gonna be talking a little bit here about uh the Craft Brewers Conference CBC. Uh it, going to be hosted in nashville this year are there any uh cheese spots in nashville that you know of that you'd recommend uh check out uh grays they just opened in nashville uh grays is awesome g-r-e-y-s they originated i believe in knoxville uh nashville is their new venture super sweet people uh they really know their stuff um and i would definitely recommend checking them out they also do Really fantastic sandwiches. Uh, so check out Grace. Oof, that sounds like a good spot to go. Like buy a nice hunk of cheese if, and get a good sandwich. If you're in Tennessee and you can find anything from uh, Blackberry Farms, also oh, yeah. pick those up because uh, not even the beers, the cheeses. Yeah, yeah. They they make really fantastic cheese as well. I'm glad that you spelled it because I would have spelled it G R A Z E. Oh, great. Because okay. Okay. Because you're clever. Goats. Yeah. No, no, no. No. <laughs> uh, but other in in other national news, um, I was reading an article yesterday about um, athletic brewing, which we have had some samples on the show before, but they are poised to become a top 15 craft brewery by Famous 2024. For like completely non out NA beer. Yes, athletic yeah, right. athletic is non alcoholic. Um, like I said, we tasted some of their products uh, probably about a year ago at this point, and uh, really good. And I, I've bought a few since then, and they they really like have refined that profile that they're trying to hit. And I mean, unless you've got your eyes closed, you're understanding a little bit more that people are trending towards uh, not drinking as much, and now. Even I, I noticed I went to a concert last weekend and I was like, okay, well, like me and maybe like 15 other people have beers and this is a sold out show. And uh, I, I think everything comes in ebbs and flows. So just trendy. But the fact that a non-alcoholic beer company can burst into the top 15 craft breweries is, I think, pretty remarkable on its own. Within a couple of years, because they were they. They're an older brewery. I don't remember when they were founded. They've been around since 2017. Yeah. 17. But yeah. they really like had, I mean, during COVID kind of is when their exponential growth seemed like it started. I don't know that uh, part, but I mean, like 170,000 barrels in 2022 alone. Nuts. It was pretty Dude, insane. For non-alcoholic beer that's ex kind of expensive. I mean, there's nobody in Louisville that's producing or in the state that's producing maybe West Six. 
but like 170,000 barrels of beer is that's that's a massive scale and they're selling it and they're distributing it and uh people are buying it i yeah and i buy it i mean it's, i, I it's think good. they have a, a really good marketing uh angle too um calling something athletic kind of also leans into that whole idea that it is healthier for you mm-hmm. and it is better for you and it is like it is the gym that you should be acquiring yeah. um i think they do a really good job and and they they lean into that with their marketing <laughs> dollars too with the uh, sponsorships uh sponsoring different uh races you know whether they be like 10ks or halves or trail runs uh they or definitely cheese runs they yeah, they they lean into that um that that culture um it's it's been impressive to to see them do that um and also they they have the benefit of you know having zero restrictions for e-commerce they can you know self distro they can with, sell to miners maybe that's what it's they can, uh, maybe that's who's buying it yeah i mean like they can just sell it to any not. any state they want <laughs> uh and they can do it on their own you know via ups fedex whatever they do and every other brewery struggles with that either based on their own laws or they just weren't made for that I mean, if you're talking about, I know Burial does a lot of shipping now, and you're talking about, you know, forty dollar plus, you know, shipping fee just just to get a case or whatever, a couple six packs. I don't know. Yeah, in the the way that they've done it has just positioned that. I think they were a little ahead of the game starting in 2017. I mean, they were way ahead of anything non-alcoholic, in my opinion. I didn't even think about anything non-alcoholic at that point, besides like. What Heineken Zero might yeah. have been out by then? Oduls, Oduls, Oduls. Yeah. yeah, which is terrible. <laughs> sorry, Oduls. <laughs> but but they, sorry, but they <laughs> they've sorry. done well in like for you know a week or so, and I'm like, hey, like I need I need just focus a little bit, like having fun. But I I would just I would still like to go out to the bar with my friends, but I kind of just want to like have a soda water or something else. This is a great alternative. Um, I feel like I'm super plugging them. But well, it I is like good them. to have an yeah, alternative. I like them. Yeah. yeah. And like, you know, we had uh, Sam Cruz on a few weeks ago and he was like, ah, I think you might have persuaded him a little bit by the end to at least consider it. But he's like, yeah, you know, but a lot of breweries, I mean, brewing non-alcoholic beer is hard. It's very difficult to make our special equipment. Yeah. To make it really good. Yeah. So being able to outsource that to athletic and then just being able to have like one option on, you know, that's that's huge. That's a great business model. Honestly, I will say that uh guinness zero is oh guinness zero yeah. is fine yep yeah. Whew. yep guinness is good in general it's under under, under I don't, actually it's not underrated people it's love it but rated. yeah <laughs> it's perfectly rated it's, Perfe- it's perfectly it's rated. rated just fine <laughs> let's just leave their rating out of this <laughs> it's rated higher on saint patrick's day yeah, yeah. 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 very true it's, and it does taste oh, better on saint patrick's you know day. it's not good though smittix what? If you can get it on draft at Irish Rover, it's like better. But I'm staring uh, at all you beer nerds, stuff in the <laughs> bottles is not. Yeah, a lot of times I think those turn into like uh, shelfies too. Like they might be sitting there for quite a while. I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Hey, they teach their own man. Red amber. I'm 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 in the the phase of like that amber resurgence is coming. I think we're like completing the circle. Like hazy is a little bit dull and stouts are a little bit dull and we're coming around to like Pilsner's, Amber's, Kentucky Commons and Kentucky yeah. Commons and it's coming around. Uh, I believe we also have some Louisville Brewing Scoop, David. Some scoop, the Saturday scoop or Saturday Saturday scoop. scoop. Oh, Let's go. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um happy to announce that um our good friends over at um, Arai Brewing have finally uh, signed paperwork and filed to be a brewery. Um, they are going to occupy the space that was formerly uh, Camara Brewing and Vigrits. Um, we are extremely sad to see them go and have done collabs with them and been good friends with them all the way through. Yep. Um, but they ultimately decided that they were going to move on from that and. Uh, there's really good people, um, Alex and T Mart, that were ready to pick up that ball and keep. And it we should say, rolling. like you know, Sean built a beautiful uh, system in there. So yeah, they, they're that, getting a very, very incredible turnkey. Yeah, like ready to roll brewery out the gate in a wonderful part of the neighborhood of Louisville, um, on the Barrett Avenue corner, and uh, can't wait to see what they come out with. But uh, 
I'm, I'm happy for him. That I know they've dreamt about this for a long time. So it's good to see anybody that is an entrepreneur like have their dreams come to fruition. And hundred so. percent. It's cool to see too. Uh, they're coming from a you know they they've kind of come up in the Louisville beer scene, so they work at a big Louisville brewery now and whatever. But it kind of reminds me, you know, we talk a lot about how um, Lexington really benefited from having Alltech there during all that time, just because like how do you create a craft beer? How do you create a city full of like amazing craft breweries? Well, you have one really good one, and people come mm-hmm. and they learn and like you foster you know, it. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, nearly nearly twelve years later, uh, we're starting to see. I mean, when you, we saw that a little bit with BBC, obviously, but we're mm-hmm. starting to see this the next generation, the next generation <laughs> of folks that were working somewhere previously, and they learn under somebody X Y Z, and then they're starting their own thing. So we're starting to see a little family tree. Yeah, in, I mean, look Louisville. at like Atrium and Shipping Port, uh, even like Noble Funk coming from different place. Monic, uh, Monic, Monic coming from yeah, yeah Scott uh, and and. Well, uh, Scott from well, Kentucky, y'all, and then Buddy from Scott. And Nick from Gravely was Nick, working yeah. at Monarch. Yeah, yeah. And it's, Brandon it's from incredible. Ethereal yeah. under yeah. Scott. I mean, yeah. It's, it's always good to see that growth and evolution and couldn't be happier for them to be, you know, giving their dream a shot. And yeah. Can't wait to stop in. So a rye brewing coming soon. Yeah. A-W-R-Y brewing. They're on Instagram. So we'll try to fall. get them on the show for you guys here soon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, John, what do you got to plug? Oh man, what do I have to plug? Um, well, I was listening to an audiobook on the history of the ancient world, and they were talking a lot about like the Sumerians and the inventions of agriculture and stuff like that. So, uh, fermented foods of all kinds. We we talk a lot about beer. Um, we like wine. We talk a lot about bourbon, but man, cheese cheese and uh, kombucha and kimchi and sauerkraut. It's good for you. It's uh, incredibly calorically dense, which helps humanity survive if we ever have like a terrible like Last of Us apocalypse or something. Uh, just get a good hunk of cheese and hang on to it. Um, but yeah, all try all sorts of fermented foods and make friends with the fermenters. And they're like the the fermented foods were the ones that cut out of the food pyramid, and now they're saying yeah, like, you should right. have it every you're totally right. day. Yeah, like, you should have pickles or kimchi or red onion or yep. some yeah. There's a really great place in Cincinnati called the pickled pig oh okay and it's a sandwich shop but they also make their own kimchi and their own mm. pickles oh. and their own sauerkrauts and everything and you can find a lot of their products in town um but just drive up to cincinnati it's right off of 71 super delicious that sounds right up my alley. if you <laughs> if you like if you like fermented foods they're they're hard to like they're hard to beat mm. david what do you got um, this is uh, near and dear, but I'm going to plug uh, Drunkwood, um, <laughs> local <laughs> bourbon barrel art producer. Um, did my house marker a couple of years ago. It started to fade a little bit. And I said, hey, I'll order another one. He said, don't order another one. Just take it off the wall. Bring it by. I'll sand it and poly it. Be good as new. So you're saying everybody with Drunkwood products uh, should reach out for a touch up. To, to reach out I, to get touched by John King. Yeah, if anyone wants to touch up from John King, I'm sure yeah. it's for sale. But uh, again, customer service goes a long way, and I, I really because if there's anything that John King is known for, drunk wood is customer service. I thought he was just a social media influencer. I didn't know he made stuff. I mean, I was gonna buy another one, so I mean, I, I do appreciate it. But. Right there, folks. absolutely. Right there, uh, Adam. What do you got to plug other than the pickled pig? Uh, plug. I didn't even know I was gonna get a plug. That's why uh, I was like, I, plug. I was like, I'm sneaking in. Um, <laughs> I think I, I want to plug uh, one of my fa- uh, speaking of the pickled pig, one of my favorite uh, cheese places in this uh, region is a place called Urban Stead Cheese based out of Cincinnati. Uh, they have fantastic operation um, and their owner, Andrea, is one of the most uh, caring and kind people that I've ever met. Um, when I was trying to figure out what I was doing with myself after leaving my last job, she was super encouraging. Um, I probably didn't listen to any of her advice like I should have, <laughs> but uh, it goes a long way when people reach out to you and they say, Hey, what are you doing? Come up and eat some cheese and let's hang out. Fuck yeah. And I uh, super appreciate that. So uh, urban stead cheese, Cincinnati, Ohio, fantastic stuff. Is there anything th- that our listeners can do to support your work or learn more about your cheese endeavors? Don't support me. Uh, no, I have a I have an Instagram, and I'm really bad at updating it. Um, I'm really bad at reaching out to people right now. Uh, and that will change eventually. I've just found myself in a really busy spot where I'm working a full-time job that I'm I'm still learning. 
And I am also working on the side when I have time to do that and bartending from time to time and just trying to be a married person in their late thirties. Yeah. You know, just the grind. It never stops. Yeah, you're in good company. Or or is it the rind? The <laughs> rind. Oh, <laughs> rind for days, baby. <laughs> the Instagrams is uh, Chubbsy Cheese. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's my personal Instagram is yeah. chubs.e.cheese. Hell yeah. Because um, I Chubbsy am a, a fun founder of Chuggy <laughs> Cheese, as we discovered earlier. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, one of the originals. Um, or uh, I'm at Steckler's Specialty uh, on Instagram. Okay. Excellent. Hell yeah. Uh, on my end, uh, I'm going to plug both red wine and red dead redemption there you uh, go all right it goes kind of well together uh cheese and, and and wine go well together that's like so the cowboy does. uh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, it's, uh, it's, it's old it's been out for you know yeah i don't know seven years now probably uh I, I rediscovered it i've been playing over the last week or so and it's just fun i mean i just miss that game so much and you know you know wild west arthur morgan storylines really yeah. fun and you can eat cheese in that game too you can eat cheese in real life you can drink red wine you can drink what you know it's fun just to do that shit so <laughs> all right calm down more uh, it's just fun you know i'm just happy uh adam thank you so much for coming yeah thank you. you that was freaking awesome man that's might be my favorite cheese ever hey i'm glad to bring something new yeah thanks everyone for listening and uh we'll see you next week thank you